when we think of Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson as legends, most people naturally assume that the start of the 20th century, people got interested in Old West heroes and that uh, some writer found them and wrote down their life story. And then you get the glut of the movies, the books, and the TV shows. Well, actually, that's about half true. Here's the real story, okay? For starters, uh, both of these guys were about as brave as you can be without being a psychopath, okay? Courage never goes out of style. And those guys had so much, which you're going to hear about as I tell you a couple of these stories about them. Uh, one was from a working class Irish fa family in Canada, and the other was a farm boy uh, from Pella, Iowa, via uh, Illinois. Uh, the Irish lad was William Barclay Bat Masterson, and I wonder if he uh, said a boot instead of about, and I wonder if the farm boy, that would be Wyatt Barry Stapp Earp, uh, used the phrase, I suppose, which is kind of an Iowa thing. And I wonder if the dialects, which were so prominent in those days, uh, if that might be true. I don't, I don't know. Well, fast forward, and by the time these two young men were in their 20s, uh, they were working together uh, as lawmen, and we have the photograph to prove it. Check it out. Here they are. That's Bat Masterson on the left. He's 23 years old. And that's Wyatt Earp on the right. He's 28 years old. And they are city policemen in the wild cow town, Dodge City, Kansas. And their job basically was uh, every summer, these Texas cattle drives would crash land into Dodge. And they would pay off these uh, cowboys that were young and boisterous, full of uh, enthusiasm and prejudice against Kansas Yankees. And so these two, basically uh, representing Kansas Yankees, these two lawmen were enforced to keeping everything uh, in order. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about this photo. One is, uh, why are they in their shirt sleeves? Now, this was considered in those times to, uh, I've seen descriptions where they describe it as uh, the men were in their underwear. And they were underwear, but they were in undershirts. And so it was really considered bad form uh, to be out and about uh, without your jacket, without a vest. And so this picture is unique in that capacity. Of course, they look cool uh, wearing shirts. I'm assuming it's summertime, uh, and that, that's why the shirt sleeves. The second thing you need to notice about this photo is look at the badge on Wyatt's chest there. Normally, you get the six-sided star or the big flat badge that most of the uh, Old West uh, photographs show. But this is a little scroll leaf, it looks like, and really kind of uh, interesting uh, a badge for that time and place. The third thing to look at in this photograph is uh, it appears that they have on light leather, almost velveteen uh, gun belts. And uh, that looks unique, almost like it looks modern almost to our eyes, uh, not like the traditional gunslinger with the, uh, the belt full of cartridges hung low on their hips. This appears to be a belt. Uh, and it appears that uh, Bat is holding his hand on the butt of his pistol. Uh, so that would imply that there was some sort of regulation or some sort of uh, uniformity uh, in their uniform. And of course, the uh, fourth thing that these two dudes had in common is that they were very adept at buffaloing. And by buffaloing, that means uh, rather than shoot someone or uh, be able to stop them if someone's trying to get away, they would use the butt of their pistol and hit it upside a uh, criminal's head to subdue them. And it was called buffalo. And one old timer told a story about being in Dodge uh, in those days. And that Wyatt Earp uh, went up to a billiards hall and looked inside and somebody was causing a uh, commotion in there. And he called for the person to come out and the Texan would not come out. And so Wyatt Earp waded into the billiards hall, right into these cowboys, grabbed the guy, buffaloed him, drug him outside, and arrested him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's called sand. People that could do that have sand. That's what they used to say in the Old West. And I've often had people, uh, when I'm talking to them, they say, well, what's the modern equivalent of that? Uh, I, that just sounds so odd. And I said, well, no, there's a modern equivalent, and here's what it is, okay? Uh, if you want to know what that feels like, uh, go into a biker bar, okay? 
jump up on the pool table, and yell out, only wussies ride Harleys. And you'll know immediately how it feels to be Wyatt Earp or Bat Masters in, in that situation. So these were two uh, stalwart lawmen. The newspapers are full of their restraint. They weren't hotheads. They weren't killers of that sort. Um, they, they were just really good, solid lawmen together. Now, this makes sense, or this uh, actually points out an irony uh, a little later in the story. And um, we'll get to that in a second, because in, by 1879, uh, White Earp wrote a letter and said, uh, Dodge City has lost its snap, is how he put it. And so he was kind of bored, and so he was seeking out new challenges. And so him and uh, a lot of the Earp family went west, and they headed into Arizona, they landed in the Mile High city of Prescott, Arizona, and uh, Virgil had been there for a while. Virgil was by then a constable in uh, uh, Prescott, and they all agreed that they wanted to go to the new mining town uh, down in the southeastern part of Arizona territory, which was called Tombstone. And so they arrived there in um, 1879. Now, Wyatt claimed that he was tired of lawing, as he put it, and he wanted to make some money. And so he invested in a mine. He had other capitalist uh, industry type things that he was investing in. But he kept his hand in at the Oriental Saloon um, on Allen Street in downtown uh, uh, Tombstone, which is still there to this day, by the way. And uh, he was so excited because of the money he was making there. And he wrote a letter to Bat Masterson back in Dodge. And he said, you need to come out here, dude. Faro dealers are making $25 a shift, okay? A cowboy made $30 a month. So uh, Bat took the call, and he uh, a couple of weeks later, he arrived in Tombstone. This was in the spring of 1881, and he uh, was a gambler there. And it was interesting. They had uh, two factions of gamblers in Tombstone, and one were called the Slopers and one were called the Easterners. And the Slopers were the West Slope or people from California, people on the Western Slope of the, um, of the Rocky Mountain Range. And so they were called Slopers. And then all the other uh, guys, the ne'er-do-wells, uh, were called uh, Easterners. And of course, not only was uh, uh, not only was Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson part of the Easterners, but you had uh, Luke Short, who was there for a short time, and of course, uh, all the, the Earp brothers, and and they were a grand gambling fraternity. They called them the Knights of the Green Cloth, and they were uh, the gamblers that stand there. Now, it's interesting to postulate what might have happened uh, mere months later on October, October 26, with the so-called uh, altercation with the Cowboys at the OK Corral, if Virgil Earp, who was the city marshal, had been able to call upon uh, Bat Masterson rather than Doc Holliday to go down and disarm the Cowboys. Uh, I think you could safely say, or I will step out on a limb and say, I don't think you would have had the violence because uh, Wyatt and Bat Masterson were so used to working together so effectively. And I don't think we would have the same uh, result as we ended up in history. Of course, the the irony is we wouldn't be talking about it right now. Uh, it wouldn't be famous. It would have been a misdemeanor arrest, and they would have uh, carried it off, and they'd have gone on with their day, and there would be some other story that we might uh, talk about. But anyway, uh, before that could happen, uh, Bat Masterson got a, an urgent uh, telegram from his uh, brother, Jim, back in Dodge City, and he said that um, he had had threats on his life. And so the loyal brother, uh, Bat Masterson left Tombstone and made the long journey all the way back to Kansas. It's an 1,100-mile run. Uh, the last part of it was uh, by train. But as the train pulled into Dodge City, uh, Bat got a premonition that uh, he better be careful. And so before the train even stopped, he got off on the opposite side from the depot landing and let the train go by. And as the caboose went by, he saw two of his adversaries, actually his brother's adversaries, walking towards the train depot, and they had Winchesters in their hands. So he knew his instincts were correct. And so he sought um, some cover near a berm next to the railroad tracks and yelled at them, and they ducked into an alley and started firing at him, okay? He fired back until he emptied his gun, 
And one of the um, uh, assailants, uh, Al Optograph, was actually hit by gunfire, but he later admitted that uh, they were firing across at bat and on the opposite side of the street was a saloon. And so those people started firing back. They didn't know what, they just wanted to join in the fight and, and he was hit. However, uh, Bat and his brother Jim were brought before the, uh, uh, the, the authorities and they were told to leave town and never come back. So they left. Well, um, they didn't stay gone because uh, a little while later, Luke Short, remember him, Luke Short, the, the gambler, uh, he had bought the Long Branch Saloon and he wanted to import some female singers. And of course, they weren't going to be there to sing. Uh, and so the town fathers said, no, you can't bring them in. They turned them down. And he thought that, uh, Luke, Luke Short thought that was a little raw because they had their own singers and why couldn't he have his own singers uh anyway he uh put out the call to all of his friends in the ga gambling fraternity and they descended upon dodge city and they included uh well Wyatt Earp, bat masterson and luke short was there and they posed for a picture they intimidated his uh, enemies who left town because they were afraid and they all went down to the photography studio and they took a photo. Dodge City Peace Commission is the name of the photo. And that's in 1883. And that's Wyatt Earp's second from left seated famous photo. And that's Luke Short's second from left standing. And that's the one and only Bat Barclay, Bat Masterson, third from left there. Luke Short was able to recoup some of his losses uh, and leave town with a little bit of uh, pride. Went back to Texas, finally, uh, probably got... Uh, Got into a gunfight again, but that's another story. Anyway, Doc, um, I'm sorry, Bat Masterson gravitated to Denver, and then he later went on to New York City. And that is a whole other story, which I want to tell you here. Uh, Wyatt Earp went westbound, basically, and bounced around the west of, from Idaho, uh, clear up to Alaska, and then all up and down the Pacific Ocean front. Uh, coast, which includes San Diego uh, up to uh, Los Angeles, of course, and uh, up to San Francisco and even up to Seattle. He spent a lot of time in California. And so what happened is that um, the two never really saw each other again. I, I think they ran into each other at a couple of uh, prize fights. They were both pugilists and, and huge followers of, of fighting uh, uh, Bat Masterson even more than, than Wyatt Earp. Uh, but they may have ran into each other in, in those circles. But for all intents and purposes, they never saw each other again. And yet, Bab Masterson was to absolutely grease the gears to make this unknown guy, Wyatt Earp, into an icon. Let me just give you a quote. And this is a uh, quote from Bat Masterson on his friend. Wyatt Earp has excited by his displays of great courage and nerve under trying circumstances, the envy and hatred of those small minded creatures with which the world seems to be abundantly peopled and whose sole delight in life seems to be in fly specking the reputations of real men. That is not only a true friend, but that is a friend who made Wyatt Earp an icon. So after their adventures in Kansas and the Southwest, the two sporting men basically went their separate ways with Earp going west and Masterson going east. Now Masterson uh, gravitated to the east. In fact, in 19, uh, excuse me, 1895, he acted as a bodyguard for the millionaire George Gould in New York City. And uh, he wrote to his friends back in Denver that he loved fishing off of Gould's yacht. So that was his first taste of the East Coast, and he really liked it. He went back to Denver a couple times. He had some more adventures, misadventures. And then finally, uh, he wrote to his friends that in June of 1902, he went back there uh, to live. Uh, he really liked it there, and he wanted to see what he could do with his life. He met, uh, because he was kind of famous in the West, he met Alfred Henry Lewis, who was a, uh, uh, a writer, and his brother had a, a magazine and a newspaper, and Alfred talked his brother into giving Bat Masterson a column. 
uh, to write three times a week, basically on anything he wanted. Uh, and of course, he loved boxing, so a lot of the uh, a lot a lot of the uh, the uh, columns are, are are on boxing. And then Alfred Henry Lewis also talked Masterson into writing uh, vignettes or uh, little character studies on some of the Wild West men he knew. And of course, he uh, ended up doing that. And he wrote up character sketches on Ben Thompson, Wyatt Earp, Luke Short, and Bill Tillman. And in these uh, character studies, it makes very clear how much he admired Wyatt Earp. And the surprising thing is how much he disliked uh, Doc Holliday and called him, uh, couldn't beat up a 15-year-old kid, and that uh, very few people in the West uh, liked Doc Holliday. As a matter of fact, when uh, Bat Masterson was a uh, sheriff in Trinidad, Colorado, a writer wrote him and said, hey, please go get Doc out of trouble. And and totally against his his own uh, best interest, he went and helped out Doc Holliday uh, to get out, out of the troubles. They were trying to extradite him back to Arizona uh, for the killings in uh, Tombstone. And uh, Bat Masterson went right to the governor and was able to uh, squelch that. The bad news is he got clobbered, Bat did, in the next election for a sheriff. He got beat all uh, terribly humiliated. Uh, and so you could kind of chalk that up to uh, certainly Doc Holliday, uh, but his good friend Wyatt Earp didn't uh, serve him very well there. Well, uh, through uh, Lewis um, and, and this connection to the publishing, um, uh, Bat Masterson became very friendly with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt, uh, of course, uh, uh, sent it into the White House because of assassination. And um, in 1905, in that uh, era, Bat Masterson was a frequent visitor to the White House. In fact, um, uh, Teddy gave him a deputy U.S. marshalship that paid like 2000 a year, uh, which is like 50000 today. Uh, so he was, in, he was in pink with the, uh, the president. And supposedly at one of these um, meetings at the White House, uh, Bat Masterson said something to the effect of the true story of the West will never be known until Wyatt Earp talks. And Wyatt Earp isn't talking. Well, a young press secretary who was there in the White House, his name was Stuart Lake, heard that comment and it kind of stuck in his head. And um, several years later, uh, Bat Masterson was typing at his desk uh, for, a new, for his newspaper column and he died of a heart attack. Now let's go out to Los Angeles and catch up with Wyatt Earp. While Bat Masterson is on the East Coast, hobnobbing with some of the biggest names in the, in, in the, in the country, the same thing's happening to Wyatt Earp in Hollywood, California, the last outlaw town. Earp gravitated there because uh, there was a lot of poker games. There was a lot of people he could fleece. Uh, a lot of the people that were kind of carny type people were in the movie business. As a matter of fact, um, it was Zane Gray who said, uh, I won't say that everyone in the movie business is a crook, but I will say that all the people in Los Angeles uh, who are crooks are in the movie business. And so uh, White Earp just, of course, fit right in there. And it wasn't long before he befriended two of the biggest names in uh, Western movie stars, and that's William S. Hart and Tom Mix. Tom Mix was making like $10,000 a week or something like that without income tax. So the guy was rolled into the dough. He loved Wyatt Earp because Wyatt Earp was the real deal. And so uh, the two of them thought that they would get culture. And so uh, Tom Mix ordered, because he was so rich, uh, a whole stack of books by Shakespeare's plays. And so they uh, were going to read these and hopefully get culture and bring themselves up by their bootstraps in life. And somebody asked uh, Earp what he thought of Shakespeare. And he allegedly said uh, that feller Hamlet was sure talkative. He wouldn't have lasted long in Kansas. Well, uh, as you probably know, Wyatt Earp lasted long in Kansas because he wasn't a talker is another little example of uh, the guy who didn't like to talk is that on the evening of October 25th, 1881, uh, Ike Clanton was on a tear in Tombstone and he was uh, kept threatening the herbs and said in the morning, uh, the ball will open and I just want four feet of ground and I'm going to fight you. 
And so he, uh, Leiter, closed out his faro table at the Oriental and was walking home. And I, Clanton, is walking along the boardwalk on Allen Street, and he's hammering uh, Earp and saying, oh, you know, in the morning, we're going to fight. And Leiter said a fabulous quote. Leiter said, Ike, you talk too much for a fighting man. Earp's greatest strength was that he didn't talk. He fought, okay? And at the same time, when it came time for him to cash in his fame, he didn't talk. So when Stuart Lake came out from the East Coast and found Wyatt Earp and tried to interview him, Lake found an old man who answered in monosyllabic ways, and he basically had three answers. Yep. Nope. Don't recall. And so Lake was really frustrated, and he uh, then, uh, then Earp dies himself in 29, and so now Stuart Lake can write anything that he wants. And so he writes up this, uh, what became uh, White Earp Frontier Marshall, and it becomes a huge hit after Earp's death. Earp could not sell his own story because he wasn't a writer, but Bat Masterson was. So in the end, after Wyatt's passing and with the publication of Stuart Lake's Frontier Marshall, Wyatt Earp rose from a regional character into the icon that he is today. Today, he stands shoulder to shoulder with Jesse James, Crazy Horse, and Geronimo, and Wild Bill, okay? And he has his good friend, William Barclay, Bat Masterson, to thank for that. Hey, if you like this video and want to see more of that, comment down below. It really helps, okay? And be sure to hit the subscribe button down below and click on the bell next to it. You know, for Bob Bell, click on the bell, okay?